in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a video data set for the um, exploration of factors affecting webcam-based automated gaze coding. And um, I'm Hiromichi Hagihara, uh, a postdoc researcher at the University of Tokyo, Japan. And this study um, is a collaborative work with um, um, Lorraine um, Zad Nordic and Roderick Cusack at Trinity College Dublin and also um, Shotsuji at the University of Tokyo. And also um, this work um, is one of the um, sub um, projects of Mini Babies at Home. Um, this is an international multi-lab collaboration, uh, collaboration projects that aims to facilitate practical and technical um, aspects of online testing for um, specific infant um, studies. Okay. So um, why are um, online behavior um, experiments um, important? So maybe uh, many of you know um, online testing um, have enabled researchers to um, enlarge um, sample sites um, and um, access diverse populations um, regardless of locations. Online testing enables researchers to run experiments efficiently um, with lower costs in terms of time and money, and also it enhances um, reproducibility, specifically when experiments um, is perform being performed um, in like kind of a um, synchronous way. And um, those kind of um, benefits um, contribute um, to overcoming concerns um, such as um, low statistical power, um, resulted from um, the fewer sites of um, sub sample size and um, kind of wired problem uh, and also implicit of protocols. So developmental psychologists um, increasingly trying to um, use those kind of online experiment platforms um, to um, conduct um, research. And um, because um, infants uh, cannot like explicit behavior responses, like verbal responses, um, the main outcome measure is um, infants looking um, data uh, collected by a webcam when um, doing online experiments. So basically, um, in those kind of um, studies, um, developmental psychologists show um, visual or auditory um, stimuli um, to infants. And for instance, in this example, um, there are juxtaposed um, two videos um, of like dog and car and um, say like, look, look, a dog or something like that. And um, then um, collect the webcam based data of like infant um, behaviors, such as like looking directions of um, looking left, right, or like away from the monitor. Okay. And there are um, several um, platforms that developmental psychologists can use to run those kind of online experiments for infants. And um, one, one example is Lookit. Um, and, but there are still um, like developing, um, this is still a developing um, field. And um, when it comes to infant studies, um, like um, developmental psychologists usually need only coarse um, case coding. Uh, such as looking time or uh, preferential looking of um, looking left, right, or, or away from the monitor, something like that. So um, developmental psychologists usually don't need uh, fine-grained like gaze um, coordinates um, of monitor. Um, they usually need two or three classifications, like looking or not looking, or a kind of left, right, or away, or something like that. Despite this simple coding, um, frame by frame manual coding is quite um, labor intensive and it takes at least several times as long as the duration of the um, video recordings. So um, that's why developmental psychologists are now trying to um, use automated case coding algorithms um, to um, process the webcam based video data. However, um, webcam data um, collected at home varies um, in terms of, for instance, like lighting conditions um, or uh, face position of infants. For instance, um, infants may not be center of the um, camera and um, there might be some fa facial occlusion um, of, uh, or face rollings or rotation or um, distance um, to the webcam um, may vary. In order to investigate to what extent those kind of factors, environmental or behavioral factors, 
um, affect the accuracy of the existing automated um, gaze classifications. Um, we created um, adult webcam data set that systematically um, reproduces um, factors. And we ran an algorithm designed for um, spe specifically infant studies and um, investigated um, prediction accuracy. In this study, we used um, one of the state-of-the-art um, algorithms um, called iCatcher Plus. We co collected um, webcam data from 60 adult participants in Ireland and Japan. Um, mean uh, age was 26.5. Um, and um, among those 60 participants, 47 uh, participants agreed with making their data, video data publicly available. And we included um, mainly four um, environmental or behavioral factor predictor of the, the factor uh, that may affect um, infant um, automated gaze coding or uh, infant studies. So uh, one is lighting source, and um, the second is um, position um, in terms of left or right, and rolling um, of the face, and also distance to the camera. So basically, um, I will just um, briefly explain um, how we collected the data. So um, according to the um, sound, um, participants were asked to um, look at the designated number of plates, so one to 10. Um, aligned horizontally um, on the wall. And we collected um, those kind of data, uh, webcam data, um, while like um, changing the position um, of the participants and also the um, face rolling um, of participants. And um, the distance um, from the camera, um, position in terms of left or right, or um, face rolling was the within um, participant factors, but only lighting source uh, was, uh, we, we regarded lighting source as a between participant uh, factor. And I will just quickly show you um, the uh, data collection plates. We collected uh, video data um, using those kind of like um, procedure. This is uh, one of the uh, primary results um, we um, now have. So, um, in terms of um, proportions of um, face detected face detection, um, almost all factors affected the um, the face detection, lighting, um, distance. Um, position rotation of those factors significantly affected um, face detection. And uh, when looking at the um, estimates of each factor, um, especially um, lighting and distance from the camera uh, greatly uh, influenced um, whether like automated case coding um, algorithms could detect um, face properly or not. So as you see in this um, right figure, um, so if the, um, when the participants were uh, within like 90 centimeters um, of the distance, the face was successfully detected in many cases, uh, almost cases, but if participants were like far away um, from, from the camera, um, the like face detection um, failed uh, in many cases. And also you can see, um, as you can see, um, lighting um, affected greatly. So this is one of the results. The, all the included factors affected gaze detection, um, especially distance and lighting sources. And in terms of um, gaze um, direction classification, um, correct coding differ um, across monitor sites. For instance, um, if the monitor size was kind of like small, relatively smaller, um, this uh, kind of, um, classification will be the correct answer of left, right, away. And if you have like middle size of the monitor, um, the classification, the like actual classification might be changed. And also if you have um, bigger size of the monitor, maybe that might be the change. So um, depending on, on the monitor size, um, those kind of like classification definition might be, um, might vary. Um, but um, because we used like number plates um, horizontally aligned on the wall instead of monitor. Um, maybe um, like 
other researchers can um, assess uh, other like plot using our um, data set. So I will just show you um, this uh, middle size monitor, uh, middle monitor size um, pattern. So um, when we um, regard it, those kind of classification as a correct answer, even um, many, uh, most of the uh, factors we included affected um, the uh, proportion of correct prediction made by um, IKJ Pass, the one of the state of the art um, automated gaze coding um, algorithms. And um, specifically, um, lighting, when we look at the estimates um, of regression models, um, lighting source and um, rotation of the face um, greatly affected um, whether the um, algorithm could detect the facial and gauge direction um, successfully or not. So most of the factors affected gaze um, coding accuracy. Um, especially lighting source and face rollings. Factors affect face um, detection and also gaze classifications. And practically, um, lighting source distance and roll face rolling um, would matter. And um, compared with those um, factors, um, le left right position of the um, infant's face uh, might uh, have less influenced um, the accuracy or face detection. This data set, so now we are. Um, working on preparing to um, the, make the data set publicly available. And also we are um, trying another existing algorithms for infant studies to, um, to, to assess the generalizability of our findings. And also um, our data set um, that systematically include factors um, that affect the automated gate coding will enable researchers to not only like elucidate which factors influence accuracy of automated classification of looking behavior and assess the robustness of the existing automated gate coding methods um, as I um, reported today, uh, but also um, it may enable researchers to um, improve the um, coding algorithms um, by like training um, the model using our data set or uh, provide better instructions to participants um, during online experiments based on our findings. Okay, so um, this is my um, contact email address. So if you have any questions, please um, let me know. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, having me back here again. Uh, last year, I had a chance to, to speak about some work of my uh, one of my PhD students dealing with complex annotation tasks. In that case, we were talking about how is it then when multiple people disagree, we might want to try to fuse their answers together for a particularly an objective coding task and say social science annotation. And this year we're going to be talking about annotator agreement. And so specifically, I'll be talking about hopefully a better way to measure annotator agreement when we have these kinds of complex tasks. So let's let me get started. Um, so this is based on um, a paper uh, my, my doctoral student Alex published this past year at the web conference. Uh, so if you're interested in this work, there's a full paper, a video, and source code available. So starting with a simple annotation or coding task, just a toy example here, you might ask three people, is there a penguin in this image, and you know, get yes or no answers. And if we have something like this, then we can pretty easily check whether or not people seem to be giving us the same, the same answers, like in agreement. So when we measure annotator agreement, we typically look at um, two things, observed agreement, the percentage of uh, people who actually agree in what they say, but also this notion of chance correction, expected agreement, how many percentage, what percentage would we expect to match just by, just by chance? For instance, on a binary classification task, you flip a coin, a number of people will disagree by chance. So there's many measures that are out there um, already for, for handling these kinds of tasks, and we're in pretty good shape for doing annotator agreement. Well, what happens when we go to complex tasks, like something like freeform text response, um, where the response space is potentially infinite? So here's a sort of, again, fun case where you might ask people to look at this image and tell you what they see in it. And in this case, you know, we have three different sentences. They're all maybe different from each other. Um, and the question is, uh, these existing measures we have for measuring annotator agreement are based on exact measure between participant responses. So what do we do in these kinds of cases where uh, the identical responses are, are quite rare if they happen at all, but we still have some notion of maybe similarity between responses. So the first cool thing is uh, there is a less well-known form of Krippendorf's alpha that actually lets you handle these kinds of tasks where you can basically supply an arbitrary distance function. 
So imagine this case, we have these four responses for what's happening in the image. A cat is eating, cat is eating, the cat eats. These are all pretty similar to one another. And if we take something like lexicographic string distance, we can see that the distance between these is all pretty small. On the other hand, if we see something like a beautiful picture and we would measure distance to that, we'll see it's quite far. So let me take this idea of distance function and show it to you for sort of another task where I can kind of make it a little more visual. So imagine we're asking people to translate, say from Japanese to English. And so for each Japanese sentence here, I'm showing you five English translations that people offered for it. And what you'd naturally expect is that the English translations for a given Japanese sentence ought to be kind of similar, although people probably won't agree exactly on what it is. Um, and so what we can do is we can build this sort of heat map where we look at the distance between pairs of English sentences that correspond to the same Japanese sentence versus pairs of English sentences corresponding to different Japanese sentences. And what you expect is these darker colors, smaller distances when they're sentences for the same Japanese sentence, whereas if they're sentences that are unpaired, they don't go along together, they have very large distances between them. And so this is this notion of observed distance. So we observe the ones that are between sentences for the same, the same Japanese sentence, but on these chance corrections. So if I take two random English sentences and look at the distance between them, how far apart they're, they're going to be. And this is this general form of Krippendorf's alpha. So I just compute these distances between pairs of observed versus pairs of expected, and I, and I sort of estimate my annotator agreement in this way. Now, the great news is this kind of trick can be used across many different annotation tasks. So all these tasks uh, already have uh, existing evaluation measures where people are often comparing between um, one, re one response and a gold answer or something like this. But then given all these answers, like which all these different distance functions, which distance functions should you choose for a given task? And maybe more importantly, does it even matter at all? So the thing you'd like to see again, this notion we saw here is that, you know, sentences for the, the same observed responses should be closer together than expected responses. So you have this nice separation here between the dark colors and the light colors. On the other hand, if I look at say a different, so here's two different distance functions for the same task. You see this on the left, the heat map is much more um, muddied um, because it's basically less sensitive and it's less able to tell apart whether two sentences actually have similarity with one another. So the idea is that a good distance function should show smaller, smaller distances for pairs of labels that correspond to the same item versus sort of randomly picked pairs of labels. So with Krippendorf's alpha, the idea then again is we plug in this better distance function on the right, we expect to see the annotator agreement go up because we're actually met, you know, we're recognizing that similar responses have been given. And in fact, we don't see that. We saw this weird thing when we started playing with this where Krippendorf's alpha actually fails to reward use of a better distance function. It's like, what's going on? So what you can do is see by sort of this toy example pretty quickly the problem. So here are uh, two distributions. We have the observed distribution in blue and the expected distribution in orange, and we're showing their overlap in red. And you can see here in the top case, you have a lot of overlap between the observed and expected distributions. I can't tell apart when things are from the same item versus different items. So it's really a mess. That would be sort of low quality. The one at the bottom, I have really nice separation between observed and expected. So I believe I have high quality. But uh, what happens is they both yield the identical Krippendorf's alpha. And the problem is Krippendorf is just looking at the means of the two distributions. So in both the top and the bottom cases, the observed and the expected have the same mean. So I can't tell them apart because I'm only looking at the means. And that's the issue. It's, it's looking at means rather than the distributions. So the correction we have for this is just to use something out of the box from SciPy, for those of you who do this in, in Python, something called the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, which just takes two distributions and tries to give you the probability that the two distributions you observe both come from the same underlying distribution or not. So in this case, again, here's this case where Krippendorf would tell us that the probability or the agreement for both of these is the same, but doesn't seem right. When we do this Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, you can see the one on the right has a much higher agreement score than the one on the left, which is much more fitting with our intuition about kind of what we expect should happen. So here is one more sort of extended case. So again, here's our Japanese English translations and I have four different distance functions here. And these distance functions are sorted from left to right 
from sort of what's a really bad distance function, essentially this sort of um, lexicographic distance towards all the way on the right, this sort of very fancy neural model thing that recognizes semantic similarity called BERT score. And so when you sort of, you can see in the distributions, you have really bad overlap here in the bottom for the one that's not a good distance function. You see much clearer separation as you get farther to the right. So when we use this Kolmogorov Smirnov test, uh, we do see nicely, you know, the annotator agreement score that we're getting, again, for the same data set, seems to go up when we're using a better distance function. And again, when we use Krippendorf, it's kind of a bit more of a mess, kind of about what's going on here. Uh, just because, again, it's, it's only looking at... The, a lot of these annotator agreement measures have these sorts of standard interpretations. Uh, if you look on their Wikipedia pages, there's, there's debate about whether those are actually good or not. But if you say something like Krippendorf's alpha, here's like the standard uh, interpretation of it. And this comes from the field of content analysis, and it's not really from this general form of, of Krippendorf, but kind of a more simpler standard form. But there's this notion that like, you know, if the, if the values between, if it's high enough, you think it's great data. If it's in the middling, you think it's maybe tentative data and you throw out your data if it's below some value. And like the first thing, you know, we saw is we had really good data that had crappy Krippendorf values and that, you know, you would be, you would be, thinking you might want to throw it out if you were looking at this. So I think these, these standard interpretations uh, don't really make sense when you have something like this, where on the different task, the distance function you use is going to change the value you see uh, for the annotator agreement measure. And for different data sets and tasks, these numbers just vary greatly. So you need a lot more care about thinking about how it is that we interpret these values um, across, across tasks and distance functions. Um, this notion we're using of Kolmogorov Smirnov distance seems to be more stable uh, than Krippendorf across both distance functions and tasks, um, but this is a bit tentative. We really need more study before we can say this more definitively. I've only talked about this sort of one example really of doing this for free text. Um, what this work my student's doing is really nice is he's benchmarked this stuff across many different tasks, many different distance functions, and many different data sets really trying to understand you know, a bit about this as a, a general way for us to be thinking about annotator agreement when we have large response spaces for different kinds of tasks. So this is the first evaluation we know of across you know, sort of this diverse set of tasks with a general measure. Um, we broke sort of from that, we, there's this nice thing where there is this general form of Krippendorf that's well known. You can just take all these existing evaluation functions and plug them in as distance functions. But we've sort of revealed this sort of problem of, of Krippendorf kind of being surprising in some ways. But the nice thing is there's a pretty easy correction using a standard method. So we provide code that's available, but really you could do a lot of this yourself because we're just using a SciPy method out of the box uh, for doing this Kolmogorov Smirnov test. So with that, um, wrap up, happy to take questions and I'll put some links in the chat for anybody who wants to know more. And I find this to be to be real super interesting. Thanks, Matt. And uh, I'm I'm just curious. Uh, this is just kind of um, uh, thinking out loud here. Uh, it, it, could, could something like this be used to to be, be applied to some of the data quality issues that we were, uh, you know, that so many mm -hmm. talks have, have addressed uh, so far today. So let, let let's say um, even something like with with Nick. Nick's task from from the previous talk that he just gave, where there's like there's a picture of someone at about something, right? And the the task is for the uh, responder to like, okay, describe what that is, and then to use something like this to pick out the outliers that likely you know are exactly inattentive or something like that. Is that do you see that kind of application being you know practical? Yeah, so um, I think. Aaron was hosting my talk here last year, and the, the, the spin I was giving last year was looking at when we have, you know, all this free text res respondent data, just what's normal, like looking at sort of what's uh, centrality of responses, what's typical responses versus atypical responses, and sort of that being a way that you might think about, indeed, outlier detection. So there might not be any claim here that something is correct or incorrect or something like that, but just getting a notion of what's sort of the normal tendency, what's typical, what is more, more outlier in this case. So yeah, I think this would be a, a nice form or another signal that you could look for. If somebody is you know, consistently different than everyone else all the time, at the very least you might wanna take a look and see if this is the guru on top of the mountain or if this is somebody who's just rolling their head back and forth on the keyboard. I also have a question just about like if this, the application of your work for um, 
not like annotators, but open-ended response coding. Yeah. Like if, if you're just interested in qualitative data and you have RAs code, you know, what the themes that come out of open-ended uh, questions, would you use the same um, measure? Yeah, so I think, you know, what we're trying to get at here is some notion of the extent to which people are agreeing with one another. So if you're trying to look at kind of what are the emergent categories that we think people are 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 giving, you might just start with you know this set of responses and then looking for sort of pockets where you see higher agreement and then trying to look and see what you think is the category that's going on here. You know, if these are emergent categories um, that are sort of going to explain the responses. So um, I would give the same pitch I gave last year too, which is to say, you know, I don't work with a lot of this sort of um, social science data myself, but I would be delighted to, you know, partner with other people who are interested in thinking about applications uh, for that. Um, we are swinging this hammer uh, wide and far where we can on problems that we think it's helpful with and happy to hear about more. Well, thank you for having me here this afternoon or perhaps morning for some. Um, I am going to talk about what is actually really a very large topic. So I'm going to stay a little bit higher up in the forest. Um, uh, I'll show some data as we go along, but um, you know, happy to drill down in if we have time for questions at the end. Uh, so I'm coming to you from the Immersive Simulation Program, and this is a behavioral science research lab um, at the National Institutes of Health. Um, so I'm excited to be here to share with you how VR can enable some cutting edge research. Um, I'm going to assume that everybody here has some working knowledge of what virtual reality is, um, but you can see people here wearing the equipment. Um, we're basically replacing people's physical reality with a digital one. Okay. So um, many of us might be thinking about VR as a way to play games. Um, but let's think about instead for a minute the roles that VR has been playing and will continue to play in science. Um, so I like this particular taxonomy um, by Fox and colleagues. And first, um, it shows us that we can consider VR um, as an object of study itself. So how do people experience uh, VR environments? We can uh, look at direct applications of VR. So using uh, the technology to make stuff. Um, creation of training environments, medical therapies, things like that. And then what we'll really focus on today is use of VR to study phenomena outside of the tech itself, right? And so what this is to say is that what we're talking about now is a really, really small slice um, of a larger role that VR is playing in science. So what I'll focus on today is um, under what circumstances one might want to use VR as sort of a research site. Uh, and what doing that can um, buy us, what we gain above and beyond um, our sort of traditional approaches that we're using today. So I'm gonna go through a bunch of potential areas where we've determined that VR can bring us added value uh, to go through these. I'm using an acronym called DREAM uh, from a recent paper um, by Allison Jane Martin Gano and myself um, out of our lab. And we're gonna just jump right in. We don't have a ton of time. So we're gonna go ahead and start with data collection. Um, so VR is going to provide us some really unique opportunities here. Um, so of course, um, it's you know really easy to capture VR data on what a user is doing in the scenario. Uh, what are they saying when they interact with a virtual human? What objects do they choose to pick up? Which doors do they open? Um, and then many headsets um, are starting to integrate sensors for physiological measurement, eye tracking, uh, a host of other things, which of course we then match up with the activity going on in the scenario over time. Um, and really interestingly, there's all of the physical behavior. So the VR system needs to know what I'm looking at, you know, how my head's turning, where my hands are, you know, many, many times a second to actually uh, work, you know, to know what scene to display for me. Uh, so we can just capture that data as it feeds through the system. Um, and we've, uh, over the years, determined that it can be used to indicate a lot of different psychological constructs, things like approach avoid, uh, social biases, attention, and so on. So a quick concrete example, um, I'm showing you here a VR environment that my colleagues and I created. We call it the VR Buffet. Um, it is a tool for measuring food choice behavior. So this shows an example of some of the measures that we extract from the buffet that help us you know, understand those sort of gross level behaviors and choices. Things like how many calories end up on the plate, uh, how many food categories are chosen from and so on. Um, also really interesting is all the process measures, right? So we get the order, the timing, um, how the participant is navigating around the room. And all of that can help us understand the holistic food choice process. 
So we'll jump to realism. That is our next key piece. Um, often in research, what we ultimately want to do is understand behavior in real life, right? In real environments and contexts. Um, and here, what we can do is assess behaviors that are enacted in environments that kind of feel psychologically, visually realistic to the user. So back to the Bear Buffet. Um, here, what we can do is simulate realistic processes while people are choosing their food. So we're surrounded by the typical cues of the restaurant, not just visual, we can do auditory, we can do olfaction. Um, we can have our users inter enact the typical behavior of going to get food, walking around the room, um, reaching out to serving dishes and so on. So this really gives a context uh, to our behavior and to our choices. Another sort of realism we can think about is sort of consistency with real world behavior. Um, so when people are enacting these behaviors in VR, how does that compare to real world behavior? Um, so I'll just show you one data point here um, that comes from our validation study of the VR buffet, where we compared um, serving behavior for pasta in the real world to virtual pasta, essentially. And what we found is that these are really pretty well correlated. So our high servers, you know, large portions in VR are those that also chose the larger portions in reality as well. Um, so this is demonstrating that, you know, behavior in VR can tell us something about what people would do in a real scenario. Okay, so we'll go now to experimental control. Now, interestingly, usually in research, we sort of think about it as the more ecological validity we might have in our experiment, um, the less control we have, right? And usually this is considered to be some sort of uh, a trade-off. That's not so much true in VR. Um, so here is another different example of some of the work we do. Um, this is related to doctor-patient interactions. Um, so we sort of simulate these interactions, but we of course take it out of the, the messy real-life clinic um, here I'm showing you a picture of a virtual patient. Um, and in this case, we might be studying how a healthcare provider interacts with our virtual patient um, in, a, in a clinical encounter that's designed to answer our particular research questions. So we are completely controlling that virtual human, all her responses, standardizing everything down to the slightest nonverbal behaviors. And I'm gonna show you more examples of that in a second, um, as is related to adaptability. So this is a really big one for VR. I think it's one that a lot of people think about. And essentially, we get to create whatever digital reality we want, right? Um, so we can simulate things that are impossible in the real world, things that might be dangerous, um, you know, expensive, resource intensive. So one example here harkens back to our virtual clinic. Um, this is an example of a virtual human we've used in a lot of these clinical experiments. Uh, here, as you can see, we varied her weight. Um, and what we do is we look at processes related to weight bias and, and discrimination. Um, but the key here is that we are varying only the one thing we really care about in our experiment. So we're holding absolutely every other aspect of the virtual human, the surroundings, everything else the same. So we're, we are truly isolating our independent variable here without the typical compounds um, that you might see. And then one other case of adaptability on the left, a little bit more whimsical. Um, this is a picture from an environment in progress, a uh, work we're um, working on now. There are some cookies you can just see in the lower left-hand corner of the scene. Those cookies are there to help us build a metaphor for how delicious and tempting food sometimes captures our brain, but we don't really want it to. Um, so to do this, we can make our cookie impossible to ignore. We can make it move, grow, flash. We can make it play music or talk to us, whatever we need to do uh, to make it that make people attend to it. Um, obviously, not something you could really do, uh, probably would want to do in real life. And then this one I think is the most relevant for us today. This is mobility. This is our ability to take the environment in which our study is taking place and take it with us anywhere that we have appropriate equipment. So most of the work that we've done um, in our lab has taken place here at the NIH in a typical behavioral science lab environment. Um, but increasingly, we've also been bringing our VR setups into the community um, so that our participants don't necessarily have to come to us. Um, but the question now um, that a lot of us are facing is how do we distribute this even further? So there's a few ways that this is happening right now. Um, the first is providing equipment to participants. So usually the method, uh, this is the method we would use for a larger, well-funded longitudinal clinical trial, for example. So this is a pretty involved process. We ship preloaded headsets to research participants for the duration of the trial. Um, you know, obviously expensive, very resource intensive, but for this kind of study, it works really, really well. And then the other is to leverage uh, the consumer headsets that are already out there in the community, right? More of a crowdsourcing model. 
Um, so I'm showing you one example here of XRDRN. This is a resource that's listing um, VR related research um, and other related studies where individuals can participate in the studies if they have access to the appropriate equipment. So um, obviously there are some downsides here around um, you know, number of participants you can get, representative samples, things like that. So moving forward from here, um, how are we gonna do that? So first, we could think about more crowdsourcing, you know, as we are moving towards more mass adoption of VR, um, you know, the numbers will just go up. This could be a really long road, but it, it does depend on who you ask. And even better, you know, several colleagues now are working to enable greater VR research access. So I'm showing you here a project that's being proposed uh, by several of my colleagues to create a more diverse and representative pool of participants by providing hardware to some underrepresented folks and creating a really robust pipeline to connect researchers and participants. Um, all of this with lots of attention to big issues across uh, research like representativeness, DEIA, um, privacy, ethics, collaboration, big science, and so on. Uh, so, you know, this is one example, but really, really hopeful for a future in this regard. Okay, so of course it needs saying um, that we are obviously not a panacea. There's lots of issues to consider. I've listed some of them here. Um, I'm not going to have time to touch on all of them, but I'll, I'll tackle just a few. Um, and I think the first one is really, you know, because we have a hammer, not everything should be a nail, right? Uh, so it's probably obvious, but there are lots of research questions that are not well suited to the use of VR. Um, so we really do need to stop and consider whether, you know, its application seems to be appropriate um, for any given study we're thinking about. Um, another one I will talk about is a cost of custom content. Um, so sometimes there are existing um, paradigms, you know, that one might be able to use, but a lot of times our research, um, our research questions are unique, and so we need custom content. And that's still very, very expensive um, a lot of times, depending on how one goes about creating it. And then the last one I'll touch on is privacy. Um, we talked about all of the amazing data we can get from our participants that gives us insight into their thought processes. Um, but on the flip side, of course, these data need to be protected. We do a good job of this as researchers, right, in our IRB approved protocols. Um, but if you take that out of the research context, it has really, really important implications. Okay. So for anyone who's undeterred at this point, um, a few resources for how one can start. Um, I put just a few on the slide, um, but I'll mention just a couple things. The first is that VR very much has its own scientific literature. Uh, this is really important because there are lots of best practices, lots of tricks of the trade. And if you're sort of not looking at that, um, it's easy to sort of to go awry in some of the early stages. Um, and there are a handful of validated and established paradigms that one could sort of use wholesale. And then of course, collaborations. Um, most research institutions have active VR researchers. Uh, they might not be in your department, but you know, inter interdisciplinary science is where we're all going. Um, and then conferences, um, there are several that are sort of domain specific in, in medicine, education, and so on. Um, but of course, many VR researchers coming to non-VR conferences like this one right here. So I've given you a lot of information in a very short time. Um, I'm going to end here with the hope that I might have time for a question or two. Do you think there's a future for conducting research on metaverse? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different definitions of what the metaverse is or is, I, I mean, is going to be camp. Um, and absolutely, I mean, if, if um, the metaverse arises um, in one of the many ways people think it will, um, I think there will be lots of opportunity um, to do the kinds of things we're talking about here in what may be even a more ecologically valid context if we're actually living elements of our lives um, in this sort of connected digital world. How are you able to validate the real world choice of like a large portion of FASTA versus the VR? Um, so yeah, what's that validation process look like? And then the second question is after you ship out the VR equipment, do you ever not get it back? Yeah, I'll do the first one first because that one's easy. Um, and I, I've only uh, worked on one study where we're shipping equipment thus far. Uh, you have to get send it back to get your incentive. Um, and um, it's always locked down. So in clinical trials, especially, we tend not to give people access to the whole you know, world of content in VR. It's, it's very much locked to the clinical um, software. And so really, people are pretty incentivized to send it back. But yes, it does happen. Um, and then they don't get their incentive. Um, 
The other piece is that what we did to validate the surfing science was we basically brought people in. Um, we worked with our metabolic kitchen at the NIH Clinical Center to present people with food uh, in real world that basically mirrored the virtual food as much as we could. Um, and then we actually just asked them to serve um, plates of food in uh, VR and in the real world. Uh, we had them play Tetris in between. Apparently that's a really good task for clearing out your visual memory. Um, and we just compared um, the sort of the, the weight um, and how that sort of translated into human sense. There's a whole translation involved here, but basically we compared what people did in, in real world uh, to VR. Um, and there were other elements to this as well, you know, looking at, you know, do the choices people make follow real world patterns, such as feeding older children more food, you know, things like that. So, um, but that's the general approach. Um, have you have you considered using like online platforms to to do to do things like that? I mean, I think um, there would be some challenges, but also potentially um, some some advantages because you you'd be able to target very specific people. You can do longitudinal studies. There'd be all kinds of possibilities. I'm just curious if you consider that. Yeah, I mean, we certainly have. Um, it's not something that we've gone very far down the road. And I remember a long time ago seeing a talk where someone where their their um, their question for you know sort of like misbehaving responders was, "Do you have a VR headset?" And the people who said yes were the ones who were misbehaving. Um, I know that's changed, um, but uh, but it is something that I do think does hold promise. Uh, it would probably just there'd be a lot of upfront work to think about how to do it. Thanks for inviting me to make this presentation that deals with willingness to participate in geolocation-based research. This research, funded by the European Research Council, is part of a larger research project that aims to investigate how new forms of data collected through technology can help researchers uh, to obtain more accurate and complete data. Please feel free to send me an email at the end of... I don't think I need to say too much about the potential benefits of geolocation data for research purposes. Um, they make it possible to research individuals, locations, and travel patterns, reducing the burden on participants and increasing the frequency and accuracy of data compared to conventional surveys. The wide adoption of smartphones around the world has made geolocation data collection possible for large samples, and there are many applications for such data. But geolocation data are not perfect. They suffer from errors. For instance, the limited precision of GPS devices may cause us to fail to accurately determine if a location of interest was visited, for instance. But even if we capture accurate information, we cannot collect all the information that may be of interest using geolocation data. For instance, geolocation data tells us nothing about subjective information such as the motivation of a travel. So in addition to errors, we may also suffer from missing data. And this is when the idea of complementing geolocation data with surveys arises. We could work around most of the aforementioned limitations by sending a survey right in the moment or a short time after. We detect an event of interest using geolocation data. By doing this, we can add missing information. For instance, we could ask someone we detect is traveling about the, the destination. We can clarify doubtful information, for instance, to confirm that someone has actually visited a location of interest. And we can do both things while reducing memory errors that would affect a conventional survey sent some weeks or months after the event of interest. However, the willingness to share geolocation data and the willingness to participate in in-the-moment surveys triggered by geolocation data is a limiting factor to develop such projects. The willingness to share geolocation data has been studied several times, finding levels between 20 to 50%, depending on different factors. But there is little literature about the effect of conditions of the conditions offered to participants, such as the project duration and the incentive. Regarding in the moment surveys, very few actual experiences have been reported, and most of them face serious problems in getting participants. In addition, there is no literature about the willingness to participate in such surveys. The only related reference is a study in which I participated in about in the moment surveys triggered by meter data, that is online behaviors. But sharing what we do online is quite different from sharing the locations we visit. So I wanted to contribute to the existing literature by answering these questions. What are the levels of willingness to participate in geolocation-based research among members of an online panel? 
for both types of activities, sharing geolocation and in-the-moment service triggered by geolocation data. I'm also interested in knowing how the attributes of geolocation-based research influence the willingness to participate. I studied the following attributes, the project duration, the survey length, the invitation lifetime, that is the time that we give to participants to take the survey, uh, the geoloc geolocation incentive, and the survey incentive level compared to a conventional survey. Um, I'm also interested in finding significant differences among panelists. Uh, I studied the potential effect of social demographic variables, personality traits, attitudes and habits, and also panel experience. And finally, by means of open questions, I also explore the main reasons stated by participants to participate or not in this type of research. In order to answer such questions, I use a sample of around 1,000 members of an opt-in online panel in Spain provided by NetQuest. The data was collected at the beginning of the year. I used quotas on age, gender, and education to reproduce the proportions of the online Spanish population. And very important, 27% of the participants were already sharing another form of passive data, in this case, meter data. I decided to use a choice-based conjoint analysis to explore the willingness to participate. This method uses a mixed logit model whose coefficients that are called utilities in this methodology are estimated from the participants' choices when they are offered different research activities, that is different combinations of attribute levels. This image is an example of the questions that we are, were presented to, to participants. They were shown 10 questions like this one, asking them to choose between two different activities each time, plus an option to indicate that they would not participate in any of them. Uh, the activities shown to each participant were conveniently designed to efficiently estimate the effect of the different attributes on participants' decisions. Moving on to the results, here you can see that the average, um, you can see the average utilities for the different levels of the attributes explored, along with a 95% credible interval that is represented by the, the shaded ribbon. The blue attributes are those that are common to both activities, while the red ones are specific to in-the-moment service. Utilities cannot be interpreted uh, straightforward, but are useful to assess the, the direction and the, the, the size of the effects uh, of each attribute level. And in any case, higher utilities indicate higher preference. According to these results, we can see that participants prefer shorter project durations, which may be related to the sensitivity of sharing locations. If we don't indicate a specific duration for a project, the preference we measure, we observe, is equivalent to three months. Uh, participants also prefer longer surveys, probably because they offer the opportunity to get more incentives. This finding is in line with the previous research that I mentioned about in the moment surveys triggered by, by online behaviors. However, here we find that this preference for longer surveys is limited to 15 minutes, which was not the case for surveys triggered by meter data. This may indicate that the duration of the survey is more relevant when researching physical activities than online activities. People also prefer larger invitation lifetimes as expected. It's obvious people prefer to have more time to take the survey. And finally, participants prefer larger incentives, of course. The incentive offer for sharing the location data has a positive effect of, uh, on, the, on the utility in general. However, this uh, result suggests that participants only distinguish between two levels of incentive, from one to two points per week and from four to six points per week with a three points level falling in the middle. Uh, the difference between these two groups um, um, are significant, whereas within groups are not. The survey incentive level has also a positive effect on the utility, but only until three times a conventional survey, four times gets lower utility, in fact, but the difference is not, is not significant. We can also estimate as well the importance of each attribute on participants' decision by comparing the variability of utilities within an attribute with the total variability. For sharing geolocation data, surprisingly, the project duration was more relevant than the incentive. However, when we add the requirement of completing in the moment surveys, we need to distribute the importance across more attributes. And the two incentive related attributes together account for most of the importance, around 35%. Uh, 
A potential explanation is that incentives are more relevant in activities that require an effort, like uh, dedicating some time to, to complete a survey, and not so relevant for activities that are sensitive but do not require big efforts, such as sharing geolocation data. The willingness to participate, that is the percentage of people that would accept to participate if offered the possibility, can be calculated using the utilities for any scenario, that is any combination of attribute levels. These are the levels of willingness to participate for three of these scenarios, the best one, the worst one, and also an average scenario. Focusing on the average, the willingness to share the location data is in line with the literature around 43%. For in the moment surveys, however, the willingness is slightly larger, four additional uh, percentage points, that is 47%. The higher preference may be related to the opportunity to get more incentives, but it may be also because in the moment surveys offer a clear reason to ask people to share their location data. We want you to share data because we want to detect when you visit a location and send you a survey. Maybe this um, explanation, the reason why uh, could have a positive effect. Regarding differences among groups of participants, I found uh, significant differences in almost all the variables explored, but the largest effects were found for attitudes and habits. For instance, the effect of age is 12 additional percentage points, being the younger, the younger people, the group that are more willing to participate. Uh, the personality traits, using the big five uh, personality traits framework, also produce significant effects. People with higher levels of agreeableness, consciousness, extraversion, stability, and openness are more willing to participate, but the maximum effect found was around 16 points for extraversion. Regarding panel experience, uh, people with more experience in completing surveys only presented higher levels of willingness if those participations uh, were concentrated in the last three months. Besides, People already sharing metadata are also more willing to participate, uh, 18 additional percentage points. Finally, as mentioned, the largest impacts correspond to, to attitudes and habits. For instance, the effect of, share, of sharing contents in social media is 39 additional points, and the effect of using Google Maps is 28 additional points. Whereas people having concerns with survey privacy and safety presented lower levels of willingness, minus 26 and, and 22 points respectively. Finally, we also asked participants using open questions to indicate the main reasons to participate or not in both activities. Uh, very quickly, when asked about the reasons for participating, one of the most mentioned answers um, by participants was that they, don't, they did not see any greater inconvenience in doing so compared to conventional surveys. Excluding this answer, a very positive one for our project, the incentive is the most mentioned reason, and the remaining answers were not particularly related to geolocation data, except interest in or curiosity for a new form of research. It's worth mentioning that several participants assume that we will share uh, some feedback with them about the data they provide. For instance, their frequent routes or the average distance travel, etc even if this was not mentioned in the description of the activities. That's, that suggests that providing this feedback could be an effective form to motivate some participants. As for the reasons for not participating, privacy concerns, including lack, including lack of trust and safety issues, are mentioned by more than 70% of the respondents. The second most frequently mentioned reason is not willing to install an app, with around 17% uh, of the mentions that uh, are increased to 24% if we add some other issues related to the installation of an app, like problems with the battery or, or, um, or the resources of the available in the, in the smartphone. The remaining reasons are quite similar between activities with one exception. Lack of time was mentioned only for in the moment surveys, but only uh, by 6.6% of the participants. So all in all, we could conclude that in the moment, surveys triggered by geolocation data are feasible in terms of willingness to participate. However, actual participation may differ substantially due to practical issues. For instance, people not seeing the invitation in time. This is something that we will research uh, with practical experiments. 
If we want to ensure high levels of willingness to participate, we should keep short project durations with reasonable invitation lifetimes up to 15 minutes survey lengths. And additionally, we need to keep in mind that incentives are still key. When using quota sampling, variables other than social demographic variables should be considered due, due to their large effect uh, on the willingness to participate. And finally, developing geolocation-based research on panelists already sharing online behaviors may be effective and would allow us to research offline and online events from the same set of participants, which is really a good opportunity for us. Thank you very much.